All right, well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, welcome to Spokane Dream Center Sunday School. My name is Josh Maltzberger. This is my daughter, Joanna. She's up here this morning, and uh, I'm just really blessed and honored, grateful, thankful uh, to be here this morning, to have a drive-in with such a beautiful sun shining down on, boy, just beautiful landscape, and coming here and serving an absolutely beautiful God and seeing all your beautiful faces. So, and hold my beautiful daughter right here. Amen. Amen. Yeah, God is so good. Jojo, do you have, do you want to say something? Yeah? Tell everybody. <laughs> Tell them. <laughs> Go ahead. You can just sing it from the mountains. <laughs> you got to you gotta look at them and tell them. Where are we today? Where did we leave from? From the apartment. From, we left the apartment, and where are we now? In our new house. In our yeah. new house. Hallelujah. And who, who was the first person to start praying for that house? Jesus. Jesus? Well, maybe. <laughs> Who was the first person here? Was it you? You and Sam? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Joanna. So who gets all the glory? Jesus, right? Amen. All right. Ready to go back to Mama? There you go. Well, you know, we've had uh, three or so weeks of testimonies, and that's my testimony this morning. Uh, you know, God hears and answers prayer. He's our protector, our provider. He's our redeemer. He's our deliverer. He's our savior. And uh, he really has a heart to bless his children. And, you know, we've been walking with Christ for years, and, uh, you know, we did not even have this house on, on necessarily on our horizon, but God provided for us. He he got a room for Jojo and Samuel, their own rooms, and a yard to play in, and many specific things that they had really desired and wanted and dreamed about. And God met those dreams, and uh, it's just, it touches my heart to know that he cares so much about all of us in that way. I'm going to pray, and then I'll, I'll continue this testimony. I just want to give God the glory. I'm just so very, very grateful, Heavenly Father, for this morning and for your word. God, I'm thankful above all else, Father, that you so greatly loved the world that you sent your only begotten son, Jesus, that whoever believes on him would not perish but have everlasting life. I thank you for the life that we all have in if we believe and trust and cling and rely on you, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, the living word. God, I just thank you that you are our resurrected king, but Father, you're also our our deep and personal friend. I thank you for the intimate times that we get to have together with you and that you draw us and unite us as one body in Jesus. And Jesus, you are the head. And so we give you all the, the room in our hearts and our minds this morning. I just pray, Heavenly Father, with all of the distractions and responsibilities and going-ons of life, Father, that this morning and throughout the day, we, it would be a day of rest. It would be a day of reflection and contemplation upon you and your goodness, your mercy, your faithfulness, your power, your might, God. I just pray that you would help me this morning to teach your word in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, I just, you know, again, I, in, as we're transitioning from testimonies, you know, back into uh, the book of Ephesians here, I, I just do want to thank everybody. It really was a testimony. In Ephesians, we're talking about, we've, we've moved from the first three chapters, which, which is heavy on doctrine, about who we are, what we're seated in, in Christ. And then we're, we're called to stand and stand in that truth, you know, later on. But in the middle, we're, we're taught to walk. And so we're walking according to all of these blessings that we've received from him. And part of that walk that I've tried to stress, there's elements of that, and you've probably heard it from Pastor Dave as well and, and other teachers, but we're, we're, call, we're called to strive to walk in unity above all else, to walk in unity, to walk in harmony, to walk in purity, which leads to a mature church, walking in maturity. And so I got to witness something. See, the thing is about purity, all of these things are mixed together. 
but it, it leads to maturation. And see, God has a plan for the body of Christ, for the fullness of time, for the climax of the ages. And he's, he's not coming back until his church is properly, completely built up. So that's why we have apostles and prophets and pastors, teachers, evangelists. That's why we have these roles. That's why we have these people, these giftings, these graces of God in order to not only add numbers to our church, but to grow you up. You know, to grow me up, to be, you know, that we can be receiving this sound teaching, instruction, edification within the body to be built up in our faith, to grow and mature so that we can go out and do the work of the ministry, which includes walking out your salvation, walking out your fear of the Lord, walking out your love of your Redeemer, walking out the things that Jesus taught in exacting and, and uh, extending, you know, love appreciation, forgiveness, grace, mercy to the world around you, truth, all of these things. But God wants us to walk in purity. See, there's something big about purity. And, I, and as, we, as I teach today, I'm just I'm going to go back to some scriptures in, in Corinthians. And, and, but I want you to know that you've been called out of, <laughs> you've been brought out of darkness into light. You've been brought out of the world system that is completely controlled, dominated by the enemy, by darkness, by the wicked one. We once were in bondage and just completely deceived, walking in the darkness, but the scales have fallen off. Now we're in the light. We know the truth. The truth, Jesus Christ has set us free. Now I'm just, I'm learning. Now God's given me new inclinations, a new heart, new desires. Yes, the flesh is still going to raise itself up, but there's something greater than my flesh. It's the Holy Spirit inside of me. And he's, to and he's teaching me and showing me these are the things that I love. These are the things that, that I want you to walk in. This is, I want you to be holy. You're consecrated. At the beginning of Ephesians, I was reading through chapter 1 again this morning. At the beginning of Ephesians, it says that God... He, he, call, he called, one, he called us before the foundation of the world. He, he decided he wants to present you before him blameless, holy. I mean, he wants to present you before him blameless, pure before him. There's a lot, there's some doctrine out there that talks about only the things that Christ has done for us. And it takes away the response. It negates the response. Even saying the response isn't necessary. The response is absolutely expected by God. It's expected by Paul. It's completely throughout every one of his letters. But there's a response that we're to have as we receive this great news that God chose you. He called you. He predestined for you to become a part of his own family. He's blessed you with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. He's paid the price to purchase you. The cost of your redemption was paid in full by Christ Jesus. All of your sins, past, present, future, have been completely forgiven. He's done it. He's brought you in. But now, as we walk and we, as we mature as a body, if we want to walk in unity... Which we do, amen? Hopefully nobody wants to just be the Lone Ranger out there. You guys do, you do you, and I'm going to do me. We, that's our flesh. That's not God's will. God's desire is for us to walk in unity. He wants us to walk in harmony. You ever listen to a couple people that can't sing real well? Or like they're, right? You know when harmony is not off, right? When it's off, you can, you can hear it. And when it's working, it's something to behold. It's beautiful. When you hear something that's harmonious. See, God wants us to walk in harmony. You have different giftings, different talents, different abilities, different, you know, different experiences, different testimonies, as we've heard. He's utilizing all of those things. He's working them together in harmony in order to continue to edify and build you up so you can be effective in co completing his, his command to go out, make disciples of all the nations. So, but purity is where we're at. That's where we're at kind of in chapter 4. And again, it's not like Paul really has these themes or these, you know, uh, these different aspects completely lined out. They're going to, you're going to hear part of it. Oh, that sounds like harmony. That sounds like purity. That sounds like unity. They're going to be mixed in 
in throughout. But purity is kind of where I'm at, you know, this morning in my own heart and my own mind. Because, let's go, you'll, you'll see. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I think. Chapter 2 is good, but it's actually not where we're going. I was going to go there. I'm passing that. I'm passing there because of time. Flip a little bit further to to chapter 6. Chapter 6 and verse 14. Let's just read from there really quickly. So Paul is speaking to the church at Corinth in this letter, but I'm just hoping you're receiving it from the Holy Spirit for you as well, because I believe it just applies to all of us. It says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Do not make mismated alliances with them or come under a different yoke with them, inconsistent with your faith. For what partnership have right living and right standing with God with iniquity and lawlessness? Or how can light have fellowship with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and Belial, the devil? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? What agreement can there be between a temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, even as God said, I will dwell in and with and among them and will walk in and with and among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So come out from among unbelievers. And separate, sever yourselves from them, says the Lord, and touch not any unclean thing. Then I will receive you kindly and treat you with favor. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Verse 17. So come out from among unbelievers and separate, sever yourselves from them, says the Lord. Does the Lord sever you from unbelievers? It's a choice. He, Paul is saying, this is what you need to do. Now, is Paul saying you need to sever yourself from unbelievers all the time, in every situation? No. And if you go back a chapter, you'll get some more context. And we don't have time this morning to go there. But I, go back and read chapter 5. Paul, because you can't complete the Great Commission, you can't reach the unsaved, you can't reach the unchurched, unless you, you can't, I can't, I couldn't go to my job if I had to sever myself completely from everybody. It's not what he's talking about. He's talking about, in the couple verses before that, being yoked to unbelievers. Having relationships with believers that are getting too close, too united, too, you're either being influenced by somebody else or you're influencing the person around you. When you spend a lot of time and you tie your business or your pleasure too much to unbelievers, you learn their ways. And many of them were just like, they all are, just like we were, right? Under the, you know, whatever you want to call it, under the cloud of darkness, operating and having idols in in and throughout their life, sexual immorality, right? Lawlessness. All these things. That's how we lived. That's, that's, that's what we knew. We have, this, we have this inheritance from Adam that we operate out of. We have a fallen world around us. We have an enemy who hates us. And that's how we lived. That's why God's grace and what Christ came and did is so amazing. That's why it's amazing grace. Because without him, we're all lost. But now in him we've been found. In him we're in the light. And in him... We are not, remember where we were, maybe you don't remember, it was a long time ago. In Ephesians chapter 4, the, one of the first things that Paul says is, okay, now in your walk, and you're, I'm calling you to walk worthily, and he says, do not live as the Gentiles do. That's what he said. He's saying the exact same thing to the Corinthians. Guess what? He's preaching the same message in various ways to the body of Christ through his letters. So part of that not walking as the Gentiles do is, I mean, if I'm... 
I'm, if I am yoking myself to somebody else, right, guess what I'm learning to do? To walk and work with that person. So do you understand? It's the same, it's the same message. It's the same idea that Paul is saying. You can't yoke yourself to sinners. Just, just take a second and answer these questions. Paul's asking questions. Answer these in your heart or out loud. And then think about it. Not, not this is theologically what Paul is teaching. Not only that, but this is something that the Holy Spirit is speaking to me so that I have an opportunity to receive it and apply it in my own life. And if you don't understand, pray for him to help you with the understanding. And you will need to, because this is not always an easy thing to walk out in your own life. But let's just look at it. Verse 14, do not, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Do not make mismated alliances with them or come under a different yoke with them. Who are we supposed to be yoked to? Amen. Okay? Inconsistent with your faith. For what partnership have right living and right standing with God with iniquity and lawlessness? Simple answer. It's going to be none. Just none. Nothing. They don't, they don't have anything in common. Right? God is, a God, uh, God is a God of order. He's a God of, he gave us the law. So if you're living in iniquity, you're living in continual sin, you're living in, with lawlessness, you don't care about the law, you live as you want to live, you do what you will, right? What does that have to do with righteousness, right standing, right doing, imputed righteousness, but also a desire to walk the way Jesus walked and live rightly, live a holy life? What do they have in common? Nothing. What harmony? Remember, we're talking about harmony, spiritual walking in harmony as the body of Christ in Ephesians. What agreement, sorry, what harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? Is there any harmony between Christ and the devil? No. No, there's none. Okay, so if you know and you can spot and recognize something that is not Christ, and he will try, the enemy will try to position himself in a way that he's a pseudo-Christ. The Antichrist is against Christ and in place of Christ. But they don't have anything to do with one another. They are not simpatico, okay? There is no harmony between the two. The enemy, he hates Jesus. And Jesus defeated the devil. And he... There's a place in store that was created for him to be separated forever and experience torment forever. Hallelujah. I pray he gets everything that's coming to him. Amen. I've seen so many people hurt. I've been hurt myself, deceived myself. I've seen the, the impact, the effect. Just look at the world around you. He's not responsible for all of it. We have our own sinful nature, but I'll tell you what. Yeah. He's got a long, awful road ahead of him. You can remind him of that. Man, Judgment Day is not going to be so good for you. Judgment Day is going to be just fine with me. I'm, I'm fine. Hallelujah. I, Christ stood in my place. I don't have to experience forever away from a good God. Okay, what agreement, see, or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? And this is where the church, I believe, really gets it. They focus, sometimes we focus on the wrong thing. I talked about this a little bit with Ephesians, but the reality is, is and you see it in churches, because we're people, like, we're all people, right? True, absolutely, right? We're all, we're humans. We're all fallen. We're all sinners, right? We're all sinners, we were all sinners that were saved by grace, if we've been saved by grace. But see, there's a distinction. There's a separation. There's a difference. If you, you know what I mean? If you're an unbeliever, then you're still a sinner, whether you want to acknowledge it or not. You are. And all you have to do is just open up Exodus, grab that Ten Commandment list, and really be real with yourself. And guess what? Yeah, you are a sinner. Okay? And you could say, well, I was a sinner. 
right? I'm not sinning anymore. You'll hear people say that. I'm not sinning anymore. That was when I was a kid. I stole some Tic Tacs from the store as a kid, but I'm not a thief. But it's in I mean, if somebody tries that with you, just tell them, like, okay, if you rob a car today, you are arrested, and you go before a judge. If you tell the judge, but I arrested that car yesterday, it was in the past. Does the judge just say, well, no, like, you're, you're good, okay, that was in the past. It's not how it works, okay? If you've fallen short in one, you've fallen short in all. And I don't care when you did it. We're all sinners, yes. But some of us have been saved by grace. And if you've been saved by grace, then you are a believer. Because you have put your trust, your faith, your confidence, your hope in the one, Jesus Christ, who stood in your place. And not just stood, but hung in your place on a cross. He died in your place. And because of the power of his resurrection, you have new life in him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm a believer. I believe. It's not just a story. I'm a believer, and because I believe so earnestly, I'm going to order my life in a way that shows that I love him, that I care about him, I care about his instruction, I care about his word, I care about the rest of his people, and I I care about even his enemies, the way he did. So, but what, what's Paul saying? What has a believer in common with an unbeliever? There's some things, but you don't want to become... So, you don't want to work so hard at going, that's what I believe a lot of us do. And I, I'm guilty of it too. Well, I'm just like you. I made those same mistakes. I did this, I did that. I, you know, and there's a, there's, a, there's a certain measure that that can be helpful to get in the door to have a conversation. But at a certain point, you have to say, but I'm not there anymore. I'm a new creation. Things changed in my life. Things change dramatically, drastically, completely, 180, other way around. I went from living underneath a roof in an absolute no water, no electricity, strung out on drugs, only living for myself, lost everything that I owned, car repoed, job lost, family, you know, you're on your own, everything. I just moved into a home. I'm buying a home with my wife and my kids. I'm trying to tell you something. God, that was over, that was 12 years ago that God got me there, turned my life around, and he's been faithful every step of the way. But at a certain point, we said, no more. We are not who we were yesterday. I'm now found in Christ. And I have hope. I have expectation. I have a future in in him. I believe. Do you, I mean, do you believe? Or do you just believe that, you know, I'm going, I'm going through a program and then I'm going to, at the end of it, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, yeah, you might not know exactly what's going to happen, but do you trust, do you believe that the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord? Can you trust Him? If you trust Him with all of eternity, can you trust Him with today? Can you trust Him with tomorrow? Can you trust Him with the next decision? Yes. Thank, hallelujah. Then you're different than an unbeliever. Because an unbeliever does not put their trust in Jesus for tomorrow. You know what I mean? They're still trying, still striving, still trying to find an answer on their own. Trying to find meaning, trying to find worth, trying to find pleasure, trying to find all the things that we search for in the world. Purpose. Their own way to eternity. They're making God in their own image. That's what they generally are doing. So the answer is, what is a believer in common with an unbeliever? Not a whole lot. Not nothing, but it's really, should be drastically different. You know, the Bible says that we're a peculiar people. We're, we're, you should have some expectation that you're different. Guess what? The church has been persecuted for their difference from the world since the inception of the church. I mean, just it's just a reality check, Okay. You start talking about righteousness, you start talking about this conversation, I'm going to have to exit it. All of a sudden people go, man, you are a square, you are a, I'm I'm saying the PG version of, you know, the words, right? You are a whatever, okay? And you have to, you just have to go, you know what? No, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. And God is righteous and God is holy and God cares greatly about me walking in righteousness. Not so that I can be holier than you, just because he wants to use me 
to put himself on, on, you know, on notice to everybody around me. That there's a God that this guy serves, that he cares about him enough to not speak the way we're speaking, to not converse the way we're conversing, to not live the way that we're living. And people either are drawn to that, like Pastor Dave says, you're either, you know, you're the light. You're either going to attract people or you're going to repel people. And sometimes that, sometimes I just thought about this. I mean, sometimes spiders and insects, those things that got, get attracted or repelled, sometimes they sting you. Sometimes, you know, there's persecution. You draw them close enough in the wrong way, they, you know what I mean? They know. Because you're exposing their dark, you're exposing people in the way that they're wrong. That's what it says in Timothy, I believe. Live in such a way that you expose the areas, the way that people are living, the way that they're living is wrong. That doesn't mean that you, you know, he says live in a way that exposes that. Now you can speak that to somebody, but, you know, be careful. You go around, I mean, people, people that are outside of the word, what they know, what they believe generally is, you know, you better be careful about casting stones. You guys aren't supposed to judge. So if you come in hot, you know, just, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong. I mean, just make sure you're being led by the Lord. I mean, I'm not saying there's not a place for it. But you, you might meet a, a brick wall right away, too. You know, that's okay. All right. What agreement can there be? Can be between in verse 16 what agreement can there be between a temple of god and idols do you he says for we are the temple of the living god even as god said i will dwell in and with and among them and will walk in and with and among them and i will be their god and they shall be my people well what's an idol you know some other manufactured made by human hands, thing that becomes a god outside of the one true God. So what agreement can there be between you, who are the temple of the Holy Spirit, God Almighty residing in you, can you have with somebody who's worshiping idols? I'm not talking about like, well, I can't work there because there's a bunch of idol worshipers there. You've got to have the Holy Spirit leading you in that discernment. We're still called to go out into the world. And that means the world system. But you are not to pick up their forms of idolatry, the way that they're living, the themes, the gods that they serve. And I'm telling you, in this nation around us, if you think that, it, yeah, you, I know you don't. You guys are very, you're an informed group. The world is wrought with idolatry all around us. And all you have to do is own a phone, and you'll see a thousand different versions of it. But idolatry runs rampant, and you have to be on guard. You have to understand and have discernment in your relationships with people to go, this is getting too far into this relationship. I'm not going to even be perceived as okay with an idol. And, or your God, okay? So there's no agreement. What happened in the lifetime of David when he got back the covenant and he brings it, you know, they, they steal, the, I think it's the Philistines, they steal the covenant and they bring it back into their temple of worship with, with, with Dagon. Is there an agreement? Were they just like hanging out together? No, they came in the next morning and Dagon's down on the ground. Okay, well, let's, Let's pick him up, I guess, you know. And then the next day, I mean, he's down. His arms are cut off. I mean, he's, just, he's a mess, right? Because there is no agreement. You have to understand that. When you recognize, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. If you are spiritually listening to him, you're in relationship with him, you want to serve him only, you want to worship him, I don't want to have idols in my life. God, expose those things. Let, let me understand, you know, and not be deceived and not fall victim to, you know, going and worshiping anyone or anything that is not you. He's faithful to answer you. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't want you to break his command. You know, thou shalt not, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other God before me. He does not, he's not going to let you just, you know, 
If you cry out to him, he's going to help you worship him the way that he's commanded you to. Okay, there's no agreement. <clears throat> he says, so, I mean, look at that. You could just stay there. I will dwell in and with and among them and will walk in and with and among them. All of you right here, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. God, you know, God is in this place because God is in you. God is in me. He's walking in us, amongst us, in us, through us. He permeates the body of Christ. That's why it's so edifying and uplifting and builds you up to come together as the body. That's why when I had all these men come over, you know, and help us with all of our stuff and get it moved and help us put together our, you know, our beds and help us get our trampoline together and get an AC so that we could be in there and be comfortable. They were, they were loving on us. They were helping us. They, God was in them, through them, amongst them, and in us. And it was it built me up. I was so encouraged by that process, by having them over and blessing me, you know, in such a way in my family. Well, that's what, what God wants to do in you and through you, if you let him. But what happens if we lose purity? If we're unclean, if we're given over to something, there's no partnership with the clean and the unclean. Now, you are clean, like Jesus said. You are clean completely because of the washing that he's provided through his blood. And yet, we have, you know, even, even Peter had to have his feet washed, right? Because as we go throughout the world, we pick up stuff as we walk. But we, we're not supposed to be okay with that. We need a cleaning. We need a cleaning, right? So just walking in purity is critical to walking in unity. Because if I, just think about it, you and you've experienced it, my wife and I, okay? My wife and I love each other, we love Jesus. If I start watching too many YouTube videos on something that's unclean, how's, how's our unity going to be? Same? Better? No, of course not. It's going to be worse. We're not going to be walking in unity. We're not going to be, because if once you lose your desire to walk in purity, you lose your ability to truly walk in unity. God, Jesus, be holy, altogether different, set apart from the world and unto him, and understand and recognize that he is holy, which is morally perfect. You're not morally perfect. I am not morally perfect. We are somewhere in the process of walking out our salvation and learning his ways and walking in his ways. But we don't settle. I don't settle. I hope you don't settle for impure thoughts because I know my God is morally perfect. I know he calls me to be his image bearer. I know he paid the price so that I could be reconciled to him. I know that he has no agreement with that which is unclean, with a God that is any other God. He has no agreement. And so if I am giving myself to anything like that, I know that I'm breaking down my unity with him. And it works like that with the body of Christ. Because we're one body. So if we lose purity, we'll use some measure of our unity. He says so in verse 17, So come out from among unbelievers. That is my exhortation to you. If you've, you've been found in Christ, you've put your faith, your trust, your hope in him, understand that you have a decision to make. God will not make it for you, and it will be tested daily, often. Am I going to be, it's the same, it's the same idea that Paul is talking about in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Am I going to be conformed to the pattern, patterns of the world? Or am I going to be transformed by the renewing of my mind? Am I, I know, am I going to present my life? That's a, that's a free will, personal deci decision that you have to make. That, that says, I, you know, I'm crucified with Christ. 
Okay? I'm going to present my body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. That's my reasonable service. That's what Paul said. I'm not going to be conformed to the patterns of the world, but I'm going to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. I'm going to keep my mind stayed on the things that are above. And then whatever is pure, whatever is holy, whatever is of a good report, whatever is, you know, just and true, I'm going to keep my mind stayed on those things because that's the, those are the things that originate from my God. Those are the things that he's concerned with. Righteousness, justice, holiness, love, purity, right? I'm not going to get tied up and mixed up with the things of the world. I've, I'm glad I got brought out of that life. I don't want to go back there. In Jesus' name, come out from among unbelievers and separate, sever, it says in the Amplified, yourselves from them says the Lord. Again, we're talking about our walks. We understand we have to walk into the world and live and move and have our being in Christ, but not become like the world. We want the world to become more like Christ. Amen? Amen. We want them to be brought into the kingdom. We want them to experience eternity together forever with our wonderful God that we love so much and with us. But you have a choice to sever yourself from their ways. He says, then I will receive you kindly and treat you with favor. Amen. I just, I just think about my own family, my own kids. It gives me such a good you know, picture of, of my God. That God himself, my heavenly father, will receive me kindly. How many of you, when you're received by, by God, when you enter into eternity's shores, when you enter through the gates, when you come to him face to face, want to just you want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to be received kindly and treated with favor. I mean, God gave us favor with this house. My daughter this morning, Joanna, she says, she's so excited about being in the house, and she says, you know, I can do, I can do everything myself now. Uh, and she says, but I need you, except for the money, I need you to pay for things. <laughs> you know? But see, she has a relationship with her father. She's like, man, I can do, I, I've, I've been given this house, I've been given these things, I've been given this opportunity. I can do a lot, but there's a payment that I can't pay. Right? There's a payment I couldn't pay that... Christ paid on my behalf, but now in him, I have a choice. I can live, move, I can live for him. I can live and I can do a lot of different godly things. You can live a godly life. You can, in Jesus' name. If you don't believe that, then I am here to refute the lie of the enemy. You can, because Christ, the resurrection power, the same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives in you. God himself in the Holy Spirit lives in you. Greater is he who is living in me than he who is in the world. You can live a holy, set apart, consecrated for him life in which you do not bow to idols and you do not take up the actions and the walk that ensnared you before. You can walk. I'm getting ahead of myself in Ephesians and we haven't even hit Ephesians. You can walk in victory. That's, that's the end of Ephesians. Walk in victory. But see, you can't walk in victory if you don't also walk in purity, right? Purity is it's easy to overlook purity because we so easily want to overlook our sins. And it's, we can even use the cross and try to apply greasy grace and go, but I know my sins, they're forgiven, right? It's complete. It's finished, right? That doesn't mean that your sin today does not affect your walk, doesn't affect the rest of the body of Christ, doesn't affect your eternal reward, your treasure in heaven, and it doesn't mean that it doesn't affect, you know, your own health in Jesus' name. The wages of sin are still death. Amen. You go on sinning, it brings it brings a lack of intimacy, it separates us from close intimacy with God. Doesn't mean that he's abandoned us or he's left us. But I can be at home with my wife, living there, abiding, you know. But, if, but all of a sudden, if there's sin, if there's impurity, if there's anything like that going on, guess what? We're not actually intimately connected in fellowship. We're not experiencing that. It's the 
same thing with God. You're still married, you know, to Him, but you're you're gonna you're gonna lose out if you accept sin in your own life. So don't. If God hates sin, so should I. Amen. And I'm gonna personalize that first. Yes, I do hate the sin that goes on in the world, but it's so easy to go, man, I hate that sin. I hate what that politician's doing. I hate what that person on the street is doing. I hate this. I hate that. You know. Man, it's just sin. I've got all this, you know, really justified, righteous, you know, anger. But then when we sin, we're like, oh, Jesus covered that, right? Yeah. He did. It's covered. But you know what? He just wants us to see things the way he sees things. So, come out from from among unbelievers. And separate, sever yourselves from them, says the Lord, and touch not any unclean thing. Just, I mean, that's pretty straightforward. You know, well, what's an unclean unclean thing? I think I was talking with, you know, to Garrett about this yesterday. And I just was talking about one of the things that Tina and I did after we completed the program and we got married and we were beginning our walk together as a couple. And we had decisions to make and small groups to be a part of and you know, jobs that we were working in, and what, were, what are we going to entertain ourselves with? What are we going to spend our time doing? And so you have all these decisions every day, thousands and thousands of decisions. But ultimately, if we got hung up on a decision and we were on the fence about it, we would just say, if Jesus, now we would say, if Jesus was standing right here, would I be okay doing this? If it's not, then it's probably an unclean thing. If you wouldn't be okay if Jesus was right there with you, doing what you're going to do, then why are you doing it? Because guess what? He's even closer than right here. He's inside of you. God's in you. He is right there with you. And if you're, if, if you're like, well, I don't understand that. I don't really feel that. Think about this. We would do this. If Pastor Dave and Alice were standing right here with us, would we be okay with this, with this, this decision that we have, whether to participate or not? I'm, that's just a really practical, everyday unit to measure or barometer a situation. But that's what he's saying. That's what Paul is saying. Don't touch anything unclean. <clears throat> he says, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So, I guess today's message was out of 2 Corinthians and not Ephesians. But that's okay, because it's the, it is really, it's what Ephesians chapter 4 is talking about. And so as we go back into Ephesians chapter 4, which I'll spend just one minute here before I pray, I just want to encourage you, we're in verse 20, I believe. I'm going to read. from verse 17. This is where we were before when we left off. So I'll, I'll read this and then we'll move forward. But it says, So this I say and solemnly testify in the name of the Lord, as in his presence, that you must no longer live as the heathen, the Gentiles do, in their perverseness, in the folly, vanity, and emptiness of their souls, and the futility of of their minds. Their moral understanding is darkened and their reasoning is beclouded. They are alienated, estranged, self-banished from the life of God with no share in it. This is because of the ignorance, the want of knowledge and perception, the willful blindness that is deep-seated in them due to their hardness of heart, to the insensitiveness of their moral nature. In their spiritual apathy, they have become callous and past feeling and reckless and have abandoned themselves a prey to unbridled sensuality, eager and greedy to indulge in every form of impurity that their depraved desires may suggest and demand. But you did not so learn Christ. You did not so learn Christ. Not, you didn't learn about Christ. You did not so learn Christ. And next week we'll talk a little bit about what that means and and the, the ramifications of that. 
But I do want to, if I have my note here, just this is the situation that the world is in. At the end of 19, it says, in their spiritual apathy, they have become callous and past feeling and reckless and have abandoned themselves a prey to unbridled sensuality. If this is not ringing true to the current state of our society, then read it again. Eager and greedy to indulge in every form of impurity that their depraved desires may suggest and demand. Adam Clark, a commentator, one of the ones that I you know, read, says, this is a, <clears throat> says that they are eager to, to engage in all, it says all, in 19 it says, in every form of impurity. It's easy to just read through that and just get on to the next sentence. Clark says, this is a complete finish of the most abandoned character. To do an, uncl to do an unclean act is bad, amen? We've all done it. We've all made a mistake. We've done something unclean. That's bad, right? That's icky doesn't feel good and you go oh man god clean me purify me i want to have you know purge me right i want to be clean before you clean mind clean hands clean heart okay that's how i want to live so to do a, an unclean act is bad to labor in it is worse now you're not now you just didn't commit it now you're kind of working at it i'm working at doing these unclean things right you labor at it that's worse to labor in all uncleanness is worse still. So not just that one thing that's unclean, but now I'm going to work on this thing that's unclean and maybe that thing. And now I'm picking and choosing some different unclean things because I'm kind of just giving myself over to that. That's even worse still. But to do all this in every case to the utmost extent with a desire exceeding time, place, opportunity, and strength is worst of all and leaves nothing more profligate which means wildly extravagant, wasteful, abandoned to vice and corruption, shamelessly immoral, or more abandoned to be described or imagined. That's the state of the unbeliever. That's why we can't be yoked to unbelievers. That's why we need to be praying for those that are not saved to be saved. We need to walk in purity, walk in harmony with one another, walk in unity, and walk in victory. Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful, God, that you have gone to such great lengths. God, to consecrate us, to take us out of the world. Lord, you've given us this opportunity uh, to be found in you. God, we're your sons, we're your daughters. We've been, you know, called, predestined, chosen by you, redeemed, forgiven, brought near to you, God. And yet we still have a free will decision to make day by day to sever ourselves and our spiritual life, and make sure that we're set apart for you, that we will bow to no other idol, that we will serve no other God, that we will participate in nothing that is unclean, and that we will live truly in a way that honors and glorifies our perfect God. And we know that we are going to stumble, we are going to fall, we are going to have times when we get it wrong, but I thank you, Lord, that we are one sentence away, Lord, from being cleansed, purified and brought back into right complete right standing with you and into fellowship with you your mercies are new every morning lord i thank you for that god help us to trust your word and that truth and cry out in that time when we need your mercy lord and we need it every day so we give you the praise and the glory in jesus name amen